Andy Brick, welcome to Sunday Night at the TSO. Thank you for having me. It's really great to uh, to speak with you. Well, it's pretty exciting what you are uh, bringing to the TSO. But before we get to Game On, tell us a little bit about your musical background. Well, uh, it's a little bit less traditional, maybe, than than typical. Um, when I was three years old, there was a piano in the house, and my mother tells stories of how I used to sit endless hours on winter days just kind of plunking out little notes, and that by the time I was six or seven, my parents began to notice that those little notes were had some sort of motive or theme to them and were actually making up little two, which I would then repeat from day to day. So they enlisted a music teacher for me, and uh, it began sort of my journey through music, which was fairly unchartered all the way through high school. I was really into progressive rock and jazz and playing progressive rock and jazz bands. And then I got to college and I wanted to play, this was at University of Michigan, and I wanted to play in the jazz band at University of Michigan, which is an amazing jazz band. And in order to do so at that time, you had to play in the orchestra. And I had never played in the orchestra. So I said, okay, that would be fun. So I went the first day and went up to the conductor and I said, I have no idea what you're doing with that stick in your hand, but you know, I really want to play in jazz band. I need to do this. And he was very cool. He's like, okay, just sit, you know, we'll, we'll work you and just, you know, check it off. And the very first piece we played in that very first work of was Mahler's Fifth Symphony. And I will tell you that within four bars, I had a complete transformation. As wow. Yeah, I, at that moment, I just thought to myself, okay, it's not just about playing, but I want to know how to make that music, that kind of music, and I want to know how to do it for all these people. And within two weeks, I had shifted uh, my perspective in music at the university. I was in composition, I was staged, and um, I was eventually conducting, and that was sort of the launch pad. Then when I finished college, uh, I went to New York City, when Sananas Halls of Music, which was a small, really long way from Singapore in New York City, studied theory composition, um, finished that. And my very first gig out of college was with Sesame Street. Oh. And I worked as an arranger for Sesame Street yeah, for a number of years. I wanted to do film composing, so I went to this sort of seminar on film composing, and they said, well, go to your local film school. And but I'm nervous so it's not this one's like a really fun at the time. And so I did. I did a whole bunch of independent student films for a number of years. Got a big reel, um, a demonstration reel of different videos, uh, movies that I had stored. Applied to ASCAP's Young Film Composer competition that they had at the time. And actually was one of the seven winners out of a couple of thousand applicants that they had, which totally shocked me. I sort of did it as a joke, just, oh, there's a competition I'll enter, but that went well. So I went to Hollywood and uh, stored on the same stage that John Williams was doing things like Star Wars, so that was kind of cool. But I wanted to live in New York. I was a, I'm a New Yorker and didn't really want to live so much in LA. I really felt like home in New York. So I came back to New York. When I came back to New York, a friend of mine said, do you want to store a being? Now, this would have been in like the 1990s. So I thought he meant like write music so that when you open your Monopoly box, like the little shoe would make a choice it's something. I had no idea what he was talking about, but I did. And it, it was a game for a guy by the name of Rick Dyer, who in the history of video games is a pretty well-known guy. The game was pretty successful. And then I had my first game. At the same time, I had written to a guy by the name of Dan Trude who most people don't know the name, but they know this music. He was the guy who orchestrated all of the big Disney hits of the Mountain Dew movie. So he did Little Mermaid, he did Pocahontas, uh, yeah, he did Beauty and the Beast. Um, and I studied with him for about two years and then became his assistant for quite a long time. And that led to some great Disney films. And then I had a similar story with uh, the conductor of the American Composers Orchestra at Carnegie Hall wrote to them and said, hey, I really need some work on conducting. 
studied with and his name is Paul Lustig. Dunkel studied with Paul for a number of years as well. Um, and then in 2003, after a short interaction with the video game teams in Europe, uh, I got the offer to conduct the very first Bond game music concert outside of Japan ever. That's amazing. It's, yeah, it was really cool. Yeah, you know, I, it was a big deal. Yeah, I read that that was at the Gavant House in Leipzig. It was at the Gavant House in Leipzig. That's incredible. It was, it was amazing. We did it with the Czech National Symphony Orchestra. Uh, who I wound up becoming really good friends with the Czech players and actually became a best conductor of one of their orchestras and learned Czech and really became a part of that musical world. Had some great friends over there who continued to teach me the ways of the orchestra in a very Russian tradition, I might add. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, that's sort of my story. From there, it's just been momentum one thing after the next. Well, your path into uh, why it is that you're bringing so we'll start again. Why it is that you're bringing a show called Game On to Toronto is pretty clear from your history. Tell us about this experience that is coming to Roy Thompson Hall. Yeah, Game On is a really cool concert, uh, symphonic presentation, video game music. It came as a result of uh, not only the original symphonic game music concerts that I did in Leipzig but also concerts that I did after that series of concerts that were in the United States for a little while. And around 2014, at the end of that, uh, I had a few people approach me and say, hey, if you were to create your own symphonic game music concert, what would it look like? And I said, well, I'd like it to be attractive to both really hardcore gamers who know the games really well, who are our typical audience, but also in some way attract people who aren't necessarily as familiar with the games as the hardcore gamers might be, and at the same time have repertoire that the orchestra could really dig into it, so that it was in some way really engaging to the orchestra, but still be extremely available to the audience. And so the person who was asking to do this at the time was like, well, that's very ambitious. Why don't you get that try? So the way that I explain it is, if you can imagine you're in an art gallery uh, and there's a curator who's telling you about the artwork on the wall, instead of having a curator at an art gallery telling you about the story of the artwork, what I like to do is I like to have the musicians tell the story of the videos that we see behind the orchestra, because we have high definition videos playing behind the orchestra. And the orchestra, is sort of telling the story of what's going on in the videos. So obviously, if we're doing something like World of Warcraft um, or or Orient Forest or or one of the other big the games, the the hardcore gamers still know they'll know every move in the game. But for those who don't know it, the orchestra sort of tells the story of what's going on in the video. Well, it sounds. Like a lot of fun. I'm wondering uh, how audience response has been to this uh, show because you've you presented it elsewhere. Yeah, so we've toured around the world. We've played in Asia and across Europe, across the United States and um, to Canada. And the audience response is incredible. It, it's really, I mean, I, I think one of the things that makes Game On really fun is I let the audience know very early on at the very beginning of the concert that, you know, there's no right time to clap, there's no problem with cheering, that if you hear something that we really like, let us know. It actually makes the orchestra play better, they get into it. Um, so we, I sort of released the audience of whatever protocol there might have been. I don't think that protocol exists so much anymore, but whatever there might have been, I kind of released them from that so that they can just enjoy it as a concert of music, you know, uh, and I think that's really important because it allows them to really have a good time. And we hear that in the concert hall. When we start playing over schools, we're going to be scattered in Toronto. Uh, when we start playing that, you know, almost immediately the audience erupts into big cheers. Or when we go through World of Warcraft or, or even The Witcher 3 with its amazing uh, kind of evocative score, we hear the audience cheering throughout the whole music, so it's a really, really 
Well, I think it's going to be a, a very fun uh, few performances at Roy Thompson Hall. Lots of energy coming, to be sure. Uh, Andy Brick, thank you so much for joining me, and we look forward to uh, seeing Game On. Well, thanks for having me not only here, uh, uh, but in a couple of weeks in Toronto. I'm really looking forward to seeing Canada when kids are being with you. Thank you. All right, Andy Brick, take care. Thank you.